So thank you again, Paul, for your, for your introduction. And I am honoured to be here this afternoon to, um, to give you a, a presentation and a lecture on a topic that I'm very passionate about. Uh, I need to state up front that this presentation this evening is a presentation of my own views and my own uh, perspectives and don't represent that of the company that I work for. In preparing for today, I did think back over the last 16 years or so since I, I graduated from the University of New South Wales and, um, and considered a lot about uh, my perspectives and my views of, of what I thought about different things um, and what I've learned and, and how I've grown over the last 16 years since graduating from, from university. Back then, um, back in 2001, there weren't a lot of females around and in fact there was only one female who actually graduated in the year that I did uh, in, in 2001. So when I entered the industry back then, uh, and there not been many females around, you start to hear quite a lot uh, about the fact that you are actually female. And in hearing that sort of framing and, you know, there's not a lot of females, there's not a lot of females, you start to, to question whether, did I get this job because of my ability or did I get this job because of my gender? And one of the things or one of the sort of insecurities, I suppose, that starts to creep into your mind is, um, am I just the token female? And that whole idea of being a token female is, um, is something that, I suppose, um, causes that insecurity within you. Um, and um, I suppose despite hearing that, I've, I've endeavoured to try to make sure that there's nothing token about the way in which I go about my work each day in terms of my commitment to my work and my attitude to my work. I don't believe there's anything token about um, what I've achieved in my time in the mining industry. And I also don't think there's anything token about the development opportunities that I've provided for a lot of other people that are working within the industry and continue to, to um, help those people along the way. And lastly, I don't think there's anything token about the amount of money that I've either saved or made the companies that I've worked for over that time. So I don't consider myself a token and I don't, I, I won't allow myself to be defined by my gender. So I believe that I've grown a lot in the last 16 years, maybe not in height, but certainly as a person. And I believe that, um, that my personal growth and development has come from a willingness of being prepared to challenge my own mindset and my own views and my own perspectives and attitudes to things. And so what I'm hoping to do today is that I want to challenge you in your mindset and your perspective and the way that you think about things and in particular the way in which you think about diversity. So, um, I'm hoping that you'll participate with me as we go through, and that was the, the whole idea of providing you with the, the flyers, is so that you can participate with me as we go through and hopefully take some learnings away from, from here this evening. So there's been quite a bit of discussion about diversity over a long period of time, and uh, quite a lot of debate, but when you think about diversity, you've got to think about, well, what does it really all mean? What's this really all about? And for me, it comes down to one thing. It's one simple thing, and, and that is that diversity is really all about difference. And so the lines of difference are typically drawn along the lines of gender, age, race, uh, your sexual orientation, those kinds of things. So it's about that element of difference. So today my talk focuses predominantly on gender diversity, but the, the, the logic of what I'm about to talk about and what I'm about to explore could apply equally to other aspects of diversity. So your first opportunity to participate this evening is that I'm going to ask you a question. And I don't want you to just dive in and answer this question mentally, I want you to stop and have a think about this question. And the question is, do I value difference? So before you answer that question, I want to pose three separate scenarios to you. The first scenario 
is you're looking to do a group assignment. Okay? So everyone here that's currently studying at uni, you're looking to do a group assignment. Do you typically go and do that group assignment with a group of friends that you would normally associate with? Who more or less think the same way as you do, you feel comfortable with them? Or do you seek out other people within your class who may not be the same as you and who may have different ideas than, than you do? The second scenario is you're looking to recruit someone for your workplace or you're looking to undertake uh, some type of more complex problem solving activity. Do you choose to recruit someone who is more or less the same as you because you know they won't challenge your decision making processes? Or do you choose someone who is different to you so that you can maybe even get some learnings from them? And the third scenario is around you've got an opportunity to select a new mentor. Does the mentor that, um, is the mentor that you, you pursue, is that mentor likely to be someone who is very similar to you because you know you'll get on really well? Or do you go for someone who you're going to learn the most from? So if we circle back to the original question of do you value difference, what's your, what's your answer? What's your honest answer? So if you answer yes to that question, you'll have probably worked out that um, by seeking out difference, there are personal development opportunities that are there for you from someone sorry, who has different ideas, <coughs> different, perspe different perceptions, and different ways of looking at things than, than you do. They're prepared to challenge you in a way that maybe you haven't hadn't considered before. It provides you with a personal, personal growth opportunity that you weren't aware of prior. Working in a group of people who have the same ideas as you or the same perceptions of you as you may be easier, yeah, it may be. It may be more comfortable, yep, it may. It may even be more enjoyable. But how much are you actually really taking from that scenario? Further to support the whole idea of working in groups of people that are more or less the same, there is research to suggest that such groups of people do make decisions more quickly because they don't have to go through the rigour of developing a debate, developing a conflict, developing a, 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 a compounding or a, a, an opposing argument. And so you get, you get decisions more quickly. But there are risks associated with such decision-making environments. And I'll go through that in a second. The other side of the equation is that diversity brings to the table different thoughts and ideas, different perspectives and solution. It provides access to a wider talent pool instead of just focusing on certain aspects of, of, a, of a given um, group of people. It's been found in case study after case study, that uh, diversity produces more sustainable and more competitive outcomes for business. So down at the individual level though, if you don't value difference and you don't value diversity, then what you're either doing consciously or subconsciously is that you're actually limiting your own personal growth opportunities. Think about when you have grown the most as a person. For me, it is when I've been brave enough to either step or jump off a cliff and step outside that square away from what was known and safe, to get outside of my comfort zone. Therefore, to truly demonstrate a value to diversity is to deliberately just seek it out for your own personal growth for your own benefit. However, seeking it out does not come naturally. It's not who we are. We like to be safe. We like to be within our comfort zone. And so you have to be deliberate about, about seeking out that personal difference. So the next time you're organising a, a group assignment, or the next time you're looking to solve a more complex problem at work, seek out difference.
hurts. Give it a try. So the mining industry has always been a, a male-dominated industry, that's not new. However, in my view, nobody really saw the, um, the diversity uh, implications or the economic, the economic implications of that until the mining boom. During the boom, it became clear that by focusing purely on recruiting from a talent pool made up of 50% of the population meant that uh, we saw insufficient skills, which resulted in the, the uh, skill shortage crisis, and skyrocketing, skyrocketing wages. So at this point, there was a push to increase diversity in the industry. And that was driven by a financial imperative in that there was a skill shortage and skyrocketing wages. So a number of initiatives commenced at that time to try to increase the number of women who were actually participating in the mining industry. And so here we are today. So I've sourced some statistics for you. Uh, being an engineer, I love, I love good statistics. Uh, on where we sit as an industry at the moment. And I sourced these uh, statistics from the Workplace Gender Equality Agency website, which is a really great website for this kind of information. And it provided a this, this graph in particular provides a comparison of where the mining industry actually sits in terms of uh, the male and female, I suppose, participation rates in mining and also where the, the uh, pay gap sits in terms of males and females. So you can see there, no surprise, the, um, the composition of females in the, in the mining industry sitting at around 16% and uh, the pay gap is, is sitting at around 18%. Uh, in reviewing this further, I thought that people may have some questions or some, some further uh, I suppose questions around well, what, what goes into those numbers, how does that play out, what does that look like. So I've got some further information for you here in terms of the breakdown by the different aspects within the mining industry. So for the professionals, uh, which is typically your engineers, so there's a, a fairly good representation of females in the, in, the, in the industry there, sitting at around 26%, with the pay gap still at around 18%. From an operator point of view, so you probably typically think that there would be a high participation of females at the operator ranks. They're sitting at around 10% currently, with the pay gap of around 7% probably due to the fact that a lot of operators are on enterprise agreements which typically irons out the, the disparity in wages. Technicians and trades, this is probably the lowest rep representation of females in the industry, so sitting at around 5% with a pay gap of, uh, in the order of 20%. And finally, in the management area, so key management personnel, executives and senior managers, ranging there from around 11, 11 or 12 per cent up to 15 per cent and a pay gap there of between 11 per cent and, uh, and 17 per cent. So in summary really nothing's, nothing's really too um, out of the box there. It's a very male dominated industry and the blokes get paid more than the females. Does it matter? For me, the, the results that I've shown you are really situation normal. Um, it's all I've ever known since I joined the industry and I've posed myself this question many times. Does it matter? Uh, and many times I reach the conclusion of the statistics, of that the, the statistics aren't really impacting on me. I have a great job, I have had great opportunities, um, I've had a uh, massive amount of money poured, poured into my development and uh, ongoing career. Uh, I've got a great support network of other females who work within the industry. And for a long time, I couldn't really understand what all the fuss was about in terms of uh, diversity. I couldn't understand the case for why we needed to change the current status, as things were panning out pretty well for me. The idea of imposing quotas uh, to try to lift the level of gender diversity across the mining industry actually worried me. Um, 
It worried me from the point of view that I spent a lot of time and effort and I worked hard to get to, to where I was to, to not be considered as a token within the industry. And I felt that if uh, someone came along and tried to impose a quota that said that someone would only receive a job because of their gender, I felt that it was not only unfair, but it would actually undermine me in, in the position that I've worked, to, uh, worked so hard to, to get past. What has dawned upon me as I was completing my Masters and then reading a lot of literature on this very topic is that when you step back and think about it, the case for change for why we need to uh, improve the current gender diversity equation boils down to one simple concept. And that concept is that diversity provides superior decision making capability when adopted as a key strategic objective. So it all comes back to that superior decision making capability and being able to make decisions. If you make superior decisions, then you get better results, better outcomes, and therefore better decisions. Decisions are made in the mining industry on a daily basis about many, many imperatives. And those imperatives range from health and safety, environment and community, cost and cost control, margin, and the list goes on. In a time when the industry is being seriously uh, challenged by falling commodity prices, changing environmental legislation, and changing societal expectations, surely as a business we want the best decisions being made. The best decisions make you the most competitive. The best decisions provide sustainable solutions. The best decisions make your business more competitive. The best decisions provide the best returns to the shareholders. If you agree with me that good decisions are the basis for innovation, competitiveness and sustainability, then we need to consider the, asp to, to consider the impacts of what this decision making process and the quality of decisions being made, what it means. To understand this fully, we need to make a few, few decisions. So before we get into making a few decisions, let's understand what a decision is. So a decision, very simply, is a commitment to action. You evaluate whether it was a good decision or a bad decision based upon whether you had a negative or a positive variation from the outcome that you expected or the outcome that you intended. So for example, you chose to study mining engineering. You may assess whether that was a good decision or a bad decision based upon how well, how well you're going in the course, how much you're enjoying the course, how good your lectures are, what your job prospects are like at the end of the time, how much you're going to get paid when you finish. They may be all the things that you use to determine whether it was a good decision or a bad decision. At the end of the day, this is an individual decision and you make many individual decisions every day. But my exercise for you today is not an individual decision and it's not a simple decision. It's a very complex decision. So I have these printed out on the notes if you, if you can't read what we're about to go through. But I do have it on the screen. I just wasn't sure whether people would be able to read it. So basically the decision is this. You're the final decision maker at the end of the line for who is going to receive a life-saving transplant of a kidney. Okay? So you've, it's been narrowed down to these four remaining candidates. And I've provided you a little bit of information here to assist in making your decision. So what I want you to do is I want you to consider each of these candidates based on the information that I've provided you. You can have a chat with the person next to you and gauge their idea or you know, discuss it if you need to. But I'll give you two minutes to work out who it is you are going to select to provide this life-saving kidney to. So you have a 
Lana there, she's single, 37. She's living in Sydney. People that like people that live in Sydney. She's also a beauty therapist. She's been running a business for nearly 20 years, no doubt putting a lot back into the community. She, her family came from Ireland, they're devout Catholics. Her family wanted uh, Helena to devote her life to the church, but they haven't been very happy with her, the path that she's chosen. She's been in a long-term relationship with another woman for 10 years, and they've got three cats. She's a fairly fit and active type of person, spends a bit of time in the vineyards. Then you have Steve, he's 22. Um, spent a fair bit of his teenage life in a young offenders institution. His number, his number of offences include theft, racial assault and joyriding. His gang, the Bulldog Army, believed that immigration was spoiling Australia and that immigrants were taking their jobs and homes. For the past three years though, Steve has gone straight. He is separated from his gang, started living with his steady girlfriend since she became pregnant and has taken a full-time job at his local supermarket. He's also taking an evening course in car mechanics. He's hoping to get his high performance car um, operation off the ground. So then we have Joe. Joe there. He's age 47. He's off the market, girls. He's uh, married. Angie. Uh, he's a house husband, though, looking after five children, all under the age of 10. Spends his spare time organising campaigns against the mining industry, particularly coal mining, due to the adverse environmental impacts associated. He's passionate about climate change and is a leading advocate for this cause. Joe and his wife are currently looking to adopt more children. And then finally we have jo Joan, married, age 60. Joan came to Melbourne from Canada in the 1980s. She's worked as a nurse for the past 25 years. Is about due to retire. She has six children that range from 22 to 40 years old. Her oldest son is a doctor. Her youngest daughter is a famous club DJ. One of her sons is currently serving 10 years in Long Bay for firearms offences. Jane is a member of her local bowls club and she hopes to return to Canada one day to live. All right, so have we got a decision? Have you considered those four alternatives? So in considering those alternatives, there will have been a number of things that have come into play, which we'll go through in a second, but try and remove any bias from your decision making and maybe be swayed by the fact of who puts their hand up and votes for who or who says what about who they've selected. I'll ask everyone just to sort of cover their eyes at the moment while I get a feel for who's getting a kidney and I'll share the results with you when we, when we go through this exercise. So if I could just get everyone to just put their, put their hand over their eyes and this is the secrecy part of the equation. It's a very um, rudimentary style voting system but what we'll do is can I get everyone who preferred to um, award the, the kidney to Helena, can they put their hands up? Okay, great. Now, Steve, who, who thought Steve was a worthy candidate? Okay. What about Joe? Joe, any, any takers for Joe? Okay. And what about Joan? Okay. All right, so you can take your uh, hands away from your eyes now. So, would it, um, would it surprise you to note that not everyone put their hand up and voted for the same person. Can you believe I gave everyone the same information, the same amount of time, the same amount of, you know, opportunity to consider, but not everyone put their hand up for the same person? Why is that? The reason is, is because when we make a decision, we all have different things going on in terms of what, what dominates our decision making um, choices and what dominates our decision making style. So when you went through that process, and I've noted these down on the sheet of paper that I've given you, there's some things going on there that um, maybe you're able to tease out and identify as part of that decision making process. 
So your cognitive ability or how fast you process information and how you process information would have come into play in that, in that scenario. Your stereotypes of what you consider to be the social norm will have come into play when you've made that decision. Your emotions, your intuition, all those things come into play. Your ethics, the amount of time I gave you, those sorts of things come into play when you made, when you made that decision. Can you identify those things as part of that decision making process? And I suppose I would urge you going forward when you make decisions is have a think about those things playing out, um, playing out as part of that equation. So if I now asked you as a group of people to make that same decision as a consensus, okay, so we had to reach a consensus in this room to be able to make the, the decision around who was going to receive that kidney. What would happen? What would happen is that we would get quite a bit of conflict, quite a bit of debate, quite a bit of asserting ideas and opinion. People would become quite emotional about things that they truly believe in. They would put forward their idea and be trying to sway other people in the room to come on board with their idea because it would be quite um, sensitive and very close to the heart of some people in this room. So that conflict and that debate would play out. And that conflict and that debate would cause for biases to basically drop out of the equation because biases are typically removed when you're making things on a group decision-making level. It will become much less about emotional response and more about a rational response. Um, many studies have proven that groups make better decisions than individuals on their own. And the reason that is, is because the opportunity to have that conflict and that debate causes for the, um, the expression of ideas, perceptions, the whole idea of two heads are better than one in terms of cognitive thought, all those things play out for there to be a greater or a better decision realised at the end of the day. Now in reality, trying to reach a consensus in a group of, in a room full of people with this many people in it is, is probably unlikely and not a very, um, what would you say, sensible way to make a decision for something as, as important as this. But hopefully you get the idea of where I'm, what I'm trying to get to in that a group decision-making environment is more powerful than, a, than an individual decision-making environment. So we did talk about um, homogeneous groups and, and group decisions and the dangers associated with that. And I just wanted to introduce you to two concepts of some dangers associated with group decision-making. And those two dangers are uh, called groupthink and willful blindness. You, you may have heard of these. So groupthink is where a group of people tend not to think as a group, but tend to think more individually. And probably the most famous um, example where groupthink played out was where a group of engineers made a decision, basically due to pressure that was being applied, to approve the launch of, a, of, a Challenger, of the Challenger spacecraft. And in doing so, the spacecraft exploded 11 seconds after takeoff and all seven astronauts on board um, died. A second danger that can contribute to groupthink is a, is a concept called willful blindness. And if you have an opportunity to uh, Google Margaret Heffernan and, and willful blindness, I encourage you to do that. It's a very interesting uh, topic and something that uh, everyone should be aware of. The basic concept is where a person or a group of people should have known something but basically chose to stay ignorant. There have been many examples where willful blindness have also played out in recent history, including the, uh, the saga that's played out within the Catholic Church. Uh, the Enron debacle before it basically um, imploded with the financial disaster. 
the Murdoch phone tapping uh, situation that played out a few years ago. People knew things inside these organisations but chose not to say anything. Why did this occur? Well, there's a really long-winded psychological explanation for this, but basically it boils down to people like to be surrounded by people the same as them. And when that environment exists, we tend not to want to cause waves. We tend not to want to cause a ripple on the pond. And so people make the decision to stay silent. One way to assist avoiding the dangers of groupthink and willful blindness is to ensure that decision makers in the group are different from each other. If you have a decision making group who are all the same as each other, that is roughly the same age, the same gender, the same religion, the same education, the same race, how different will the decisions that they make be? Are they making a decision that is a group decision or an individual decision? And how good are these decisions? Let's take a look at a couple of other examples. So here's a group of people. They're a senior group of uh, decision makers. Looking at the photo here or the information that I've provided, I'll just challenge you. How much, how much diversity exists here? Diversity in terms of age, diversity in terms of gender, diversity in terms of race. And the second example here, another group of decision makers. How much diversity exists here? Now there may be an argument to say as one of these group members, I, I understand the perils of groupthink, that's why I think subjectively all the time when I'm involved in a group decision making environment and I objectively challenge and I take the role of devil's advocate every time I'm in a group decision making environment. That's the role that I take. But I would challenge that and say, how difficult is it to take the role to challenge something that you actually believe is right? And how difficult or how realistic is that going to be in an environment that is usually strapped for time and is high pressure? Typically when we're put under pressure, we revert back to the fight or flight instinct. If you're reverting back to the fight or flight instinct, it means that your fight or flight instincts come into play when you're making decisions. In such scenarios, it's normally your gut instinct and your intuition, which are the dominant forces in your decision making. Therefore, the only way to get diversity in gut instinct and emotion is, is to get diversity in people in that group. To be superior in its decision making, the group requires diversity. Now when I talk about diversity here, I'm talking about true diversity not token gestures to appease the market, to appease the shareholders, to abide by equal employment opportunity laws, or to tick the box. It is diversity that has been taken as a strategic imperative because, oh, it is diversity that has been taken as a strategic imperative because token gesture diversity just won't give you the competitive advantage that I'm talking about, and I'll explain why. So I've attempted to draw here in a, in a graphical format the results of some research, research that's been undertaken by a group of people from the Melbourne University in relation to uh, the understanding of what happens or the relationship that exists between gender diversity and business competitiveness. And what the results show in, the, in this table here is that when you when you're at the lower ends of diversity, as in either 100% male or 100% female, you're probably going to see a greater level of business performance or business competitiveness than you are 
than if you apply a token gesture type approach to diversity. So if you only have a small amount of females or a small amount of males in either a, a, a male dominant, sorry, a female dominated environment or a male dominated environment, your competitiveness tends to drop away. However, when you approach true equality or true diversity, not token gesture diversity, your business competitiveness actually exceeds that that you would have observed or that you would have been exposed to had you only been operating at either end of the spectrum, as in 100% males or 100% females. So if you think about the reason why that, that can be or why, you, why that is the case, I'll just, we'll just go through one, one um, example. So if you think about a decision-making environment that has a single male, and that single male is offset by, say, 10 other females, and there is a decision-making environment where they need to make a decision. If you think that through, when they're making the decision, how much input do you think that male will have to that decision-making? Will his thoughts and views be considered the same as the females within that group? <coughs> Will that male feel as though his thoughts and ideas are heard by the greater group? Chances are, if the male feels isolated and not heard, there will be some negative ramifications or some negative things that may, that may play out. There's a couple of options or a couple of uh, things that the, the uh, male can do in response to maybe not feeling as though he is being heard in that decision-making environment. One of the, the uh, outcomes is that he can try harder next time. Or he can uh, work harder on the relationships with the other people in the group. Or they can leave. Or he can go out on stress leave. Or he can put in a harassment claim. Or he can shrug his shoulders and say, oh, that's just the way things are around him. But either way, in any of those sort of scenarios, it's not actually the best outcome for the business because you're essentially wasting time and energy due to the fact that that emotion of that person feeling not included in the group is not actually delivering positively to a business outcome that is of benefit to the business. However, when you reach a more a qual, uh, an equal sort of uh, scenario between males and females within that decision-making environment, there is an opportunity for greater inclusion for people to feel as though they are part of that team and are part of that decision-making environment. I understand what I'm saying may be a little bit contradictory may even be a little bit confusing and so I've provided it um, hopefully in the, in the notes to allow you to go away and, and ponder it some more. Um, but where you get to is that you say that a little bit of diversity isn't as good as no diversity, but true diversity is better than a little bit and none at all. It's the all or nothing equation, I suppose you'd say, where um, the true equality sort of equation offers the best business outcomes. And so the current status of a little bit of diversity in the mining industry may well be the reason why things aren't taking off because for the people who are involved in making this little bit of diversity happen, they may not be seeing the results or they may not be realising the results that they thought that they would see. It's kind of like dipping your toe in the water approach. But to get the full benefits that I'm talking about, you just can't dip your toe in the water. It's the all or nothing equation if you want to gain the full benefits in relation to competitiveness. This is a pretty major step change from where we are at the moment. But let's consider the alternative. The group of people I showed you before were the, uh, were the board of VW Volkswagen. Does anyone know what the estimated cost of the emissions scandal is estimated at? I did some research on this before I came tonight and the number that I've seen is in the order of $86 billion. Was fudging the emissions data a good idea? 
Is it a good decision to have a non-diverse group of decision makers? You may be sitting there thinking, well, the decision makers didn't know that the emissions data was being fudged. Okay, so were they just willfully blind? Did they know, should they have known, but they chose not to know? Maybe the shareholders of VW Car Ads are giving this some thought, or maybe some engineers will just be hung out to dry. Until diversity is seen as the number one imperative before all other imperatives to provide superior decision making capability, nothing will change in terms of diversity statistics. The current, the current case for change is just not strong enough. It requires a massive shift in the existing corporate mindset across Australia and our industry if we are not to be left behind. There are many imperatives in our industry, and I've spoken of them already, in terms of health and safety, the environment and community, they change all the time. Cost is a massive one at the moment due to the falling commodity prices, but there are many others. To improve outcomes across these imperatives, to improve results and to stay competitive, I put to you that diversity sits as the number one imperative, ahead of all other imperatives, to provide superior decision-making capability. Diversity, when truly ingrained and more than a token gesture, offers many advantages. It results in individuals within a group being able to think and offer a difference because they are inherently different. This results in conflict, debate and critical thinking due to different views, ideas and ideas. It results in improved innovation and ability to respond to change particularly in a fast-paced, limited time for decision-making environment. It offers true equality and inclusion. And this issue impacts all of us. How many decisions are being made by groups of decision-makers right now that directly impact upon you? How good are these decisions? How diverse is the decision-making group? Think about it. The intuitive decision maker in me says focusing on diversity as a key strategic objective is a no-brainer. By no means am I saying that such a change is easily undertaken and implemented. But how difficult are bad decisions to deal with and how long does it take to recover from them? My belief is that those companies that, em that embrace this concept ahead of those that don't will be more successful and therefore more attractive to the limited talent pool the people in this room seeking those opportunities. I thank you for your time today, and I hope I have laid out my thoughts and case before you in a fairly logical way. And I truly hope you seek out difference and diversity for yourself, not only in terms of personal growth, but also for the benefit and the advantage for the companies that you work for in the future. Lastly, I'd like to thank the UNSW for making this um, making tonight possible, and also Mitsubishi for obviously sponsoring the event this evening. I look forward to your, um, your questions and uh, your feedback and uh, challenge. So thank you for your time.